So I'll just uh, give a little bit of an introduction here. Um, one, I, I appreciate everybody being here today. Uh, like a, like uh, Tyler was saying, we're going to be talking about the impacts of, of climate on human health. Um, and that's been my role for quite a while now. Before I came to UNMC, I was actually at CDC and uh, NOAA working in a joint position between the two of those uh, organizations to try to understand what are the impacts of climate, climate change, climate variability, and extreme weather events on human health. Um, in 2016, I was one of the lead authors on a report that came out from the, uh, the White House, and it was a, an assessment of climate change on human health. And one of the things that we found in that particular assessment, there was basically two key findings, and that was that climate change is a significant threat to the health of the American people, and that all Americans are vulnerable to the health impacts associated with climate change. We could say that because of all the ways that our climate has already been changing, and all the ways that that's tied to our, our health, and I know our, our panelists are gonna talk a little bit about that today, and that all people are vulnerable to those potential health impacts, including here in Nebraska. And so with that, I just want to say uh, thank you very much to our panelists. I'm going to just run through all of them, and uh, then they'll just go in order, starting with Scott. Scott Holmes uh, manages the Environmental Public Health Division with the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department. Scott has served on numerous federal and state level task force and committees, including CDC's National Centers for Environmental Health uh, Advisory Board. And then we have Ted Sieslak, Dr. Ted Sieslak from um, from UNMC. He's a pediatrician and infectious disease doc. Uh, he is the, he's got so many titles, I only have like a third of them here. But he is the medical director of UNMC's quarantine unit, the medical co-director of the biocontainment unit, and the associate director of, it, of uh, UNMC's Center for Biosecurity, Biopreparedness, and Emerging uh, Infectious Diseases. And he's also a former Army doc as well. And then we have Melanie Stewart, um, who's gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that she's been doing over at, at UNMC, which is focused in on, uh, sustain uh, she's a sustainability manager for UNMC and Nebraska Medicine and trying to meet some of those goals to, to reduce the, the carbon footprint of uh, UNMC and some of the potential impacts that that has on, on human health as well. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you very much and Scott, please take it away. So uh, I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, it's been a tough week. Uh, for the past six days, I've been in the Incident Command Center of the Lincoln Lancaster County. Uh, we've been dealing with how to make sure that we get adequate water to Lincoln and to make sure that the water is safe to drink. And that's been difficult. We've had uh, many, many staff uh, throughout the uh, city doing a lot of work on that. And uh, my idea of what I was gonna present totally changed over the last several days. I have given a lecture on uh, climate and health numerous times. It's about an hour long and I thought this will be cake. I'll just reduce that down and just give a few examples and move on. Um, I couldn't do that after the experience this past uh, week in Nebraska. And this is going to come across to some maybe a little bit in your face. Uh, I apologize for that. I think it's appropriate and I think it's something that uh, Instead of talking about the theoreticals, what's going to happen when in the future, we know that there's going to be change in our climate in the future, but this week climate hit us in the face, in my opinion. I am not a climate scientist. My whole hypothesis for what I'm going to be talking about today is that this storm that was basically a level two hurricane in terms of millibars and damaged our state tremendously was a climate associated event. So if you can live with that, you can live with my presentation. If you can't, don't worry about it. Uh, the first slide, you've all seen this probably already, Spencer Dam, Niobrara River, no longer a hydroelectric dam there at all. Um, in public health, we like to look for root causes. It's a big deal. If you can identify the root cause, then you can do something about it. So in public health all the time, you'll hear about root cause analysis. How do we get to the root cause of this? Well, an example of that is tobacco. We know that tobacco is a root cause of at least a dozen cancers, lung cancer being the primary of which we know. That was not known until the mid-60s. And since that time, many other cancers have been associated with that. So there's been a huge campaign to reduce smoking and the use of tobacco, successfully reducing cancers. Lung cancer rates are actually going down in men and women. So why is that relevant? Well, this past week in Nebraska, we all saw these kind of pictures, different communities throughout our state, 
Here's a great shot. Uh, the road's closed. Can't travel through there. Uh, this road disappeared, damaged the vehicle tremendously. And then uh, here's a good example of what you really don't want to do. How many of us learned again, probably, the famous saying? What's the famous saying? See? Amazing. We got that down. Turn around, don't drown, right? Because water and trucks and vehicles, all of a sudden they wash away, turn over, you drown. So this past week in Nebraska, here's one of the headlines. I pulled these headlines, uh, realized that part of this uh, was done this morning because I didn't have time until today to finish up what I was going to try to do. I worked on it last night, I worked on it this morning, so it may be a little rough. But here's an example of a headline. Historic Midwest flooding destroys homes blamed for three deaths. Okay. Flooding. Was it flooding or was it climate change? I'm postulating that it was climate change. Climate change is the root cause here, not flooding. Flooding is an outcome of climate change. That's what caused these three deaths, hundreds of injuries in our state. Climate change damages and destroys homes. Flooding or climate change? Climate change disrupts lives and puts emergency responders at risk. This event was so nasty that you had to have emergency responders responding to save emergency responders. When was the last time you heard that? Climate change damages and destroys farms. Sitting at the table, at my workplace, people I know, almost everybody knows somebody who had a farm who had an experience like was described just a little bit ago, losing dozens of cattle, um, hundreds of hogs. Last night on the CBS News, what was the story? Doug and Ari Alberts, who's been working on this farm for a while, trying to build up their hog farm, small nine acres, classic Nebraska small farm. We're not talking monstrous corporate agriculture here. They lost 700 pigs almost, 14 survived. Climate change damages and destroys small businesses and small towns. Climate change damages and destroys public infrastructure and wastes government resources. This is a well for the Lincoln well field. It looks like it's on the coast of California. It's not. It's along the Platte River that now looks like the coast of California. That's a Black Hawk helicopter. What is it doing? It's hauling one ton sandbags, dropping them to try to prevent that well from toppling over and damaging the transmission pipeline that goes to the next well so that Lincoln still has water. We have over 40 wells out there, but there are four very large collector wells that go this way underneath. This is one of them. That's about a $10 million asset right there. Oh, that went pretty quick. Climate change damages and destroys public infrastructure and increases taxes. How is that? Well, you have to rebuild infrastructure, don't you? Yes, you do. Now, why is this related to health? I'll tell you how it's related to health, okay? Every dollar that's going a different direction to fix things that are going wrong is not going to prevention to prevent things from going wrong. And that is what public health is all about. It's all about prevention. Everything I do, every regulation I administrate, every one of my 40 staff that work for me, including Olympe sitting there, they work on prevention every day. But if all the resources are going to fix things that are broken, we don't have that resource to keep protecting people and making them healthy. If we have homes and businesses that are full of water, what follows that? Mold. Mold creates health issues for people. This slide is not from the most recent flood. It's from the 2011 flood. It's one of my favorite pictures that I've used before. It's in Omaha, and that's the bridge over Omaha, the walking bridge. These guys usually aren't underwater. 
<laughs> but climate change impacts and causes mental health problems. This is proven. Major disasters create anxiety, depression, create suicide issues, even creates PTSD. The Joliet tornado that hit a few years ago in uh, Illinois, that caused about 7% of the youth population to have PTSD. Seriously? Yes. So these events have real health outcomes. Climate change makes our recreational water unfit for human or animal consumption or even contact. How? Because as we see warming, we will also see more and more harmful algal blooms. And the levels for what we are saying are risk levels for exposing yourself is dropping by about 70% next year. So many more recreational waters in Nebraska are going to have cool signs like this that we really don't like to see because of the risk it poses. And what happens when you have flooding? You get to grow mosquitoes. And in Nebraska, we are one of the highest rates, I think Ted's going to have this on one of his slides, of having West Nile virus per capita in the United States. We're in the top five every year. So climate change causes West Nile virus. The flood mosquito is not the mosquito we're concerned about. What happens is that in the summer, as we go further into the summer, as that water continues to stay in back stagnant areas, this is the mosquito that we'll be worried about. Initially, people will be carried off by the number of mosquitoes that are out there. That's not fun, but this is deadly. Every year we have people in Nebraska die from West Nile virus. Every year we have people in Nebraska that get long-term neurological damage from West Nile virus. How many people here know of someone who's had West Nile virus? See? It's not a good thing. That's a new disease, by the way, in case you don't remember. It came in 2003 to Nebraska. That year we had 1,900 cases, 110 in Lincoln, Lancaster County. So I'm positing, putting out there, that climate change in Nebraska has caused deaths, has caused illness and disease, and has caused mental health illness in Nebraskans. And with that, I hand it over to Ted. Well, thanks everyone. So as uh, Jesse said, I'm Ted Cieslack. I'm actually a pediatrician um, and an infectious disease doc by training and I help run the biocontainment unit and quarantine units at UNMC. So the obvious question is, well, what do I know about climate change? And until recently, the answer to that would have been absolutely nothing. Uh, but uh, a couple of years ago, my boss, uh, Dean uh, Ali Khan of the College of Public Health, who is a climate change expert, um, called me into his office and he had created a talk on climate change and he was prepared to give it uh, throughout uh, rural Nebraska to a bunch of small town forums. Uh, and he called me in one day and he said, I can't do this, I'm too busy. So Ted, I need you to go out and uh, give this talk. And at the time, again, I knew nothing about it, but he had a 112 slide talk that he gave me. And, um, <laughs> sent me out and I said, so let me get this straight. You want me to go out to rural Nebraska and tell Nebraskans that corn is bad? And he looked at me and said, uh, yeah, pretty much that's what I want you to do. And, and I said, you want me to tell them cows are bad also? Yep. So why don't I just tell them football sucks too? So, uh, so anyway, um, uh, I think Scott gave a great overview of some of the uh, public health problems associated with climate change. So uh, as an infectious disease doc, I'm just going to concentrate on some of the infectious 
uh, disease risks. And I realize a little bit of this may be a tough sell uh, given the winter that we've just come through, but uh, bear with me. So um, frogs, as it turns out, are very sensitive indicators uh, of infectious diseases. And uh, if you've been following the news, uh, you've heard that frog populations uh, throughout the world are in serious decline and many species of frog throughout the Amazon basin, for example, um, are facing extinction. And much of that is due to peculiar fungal infections that affect frogs. So we know there's plenty of good evidence that those fungal infections are definitely associated uh, with climate change, specifically with global warming. Uh, so there's no question that infectious diseases, at least of frogs, uh, are related to climate change. And, and, and again, I think those serve as useful indicators uh, for us humans. And uh, so we'll, we'll uh, with that knowledge in mind, let's go ahead and start talking about human health and human infectious diseases as they relate to climate change. So this is kind of the model we use in public health. And Jesse told me I can't go over all 112 slides in this presentation. So um, we'll, we'll try to keep it much briefer than that, and I'll just give you the thumbnail sketch here. Uh, but this is the model we use, and you can see that climate change affects human health um, in a number of ways, and we put those into six categories that are spread across the bottom of this slide. So the first of those uh, that relates to infectious diseases is that of vector-borne diseases. So let's talk about those. So. Climactic factors, we believe, influence vector-borne zoonotic diseases, diseases that humans get from animals um, in a number of ways. First of all, they affect the distribution and abundance of vectors and of vector-borne pathogens, and they affect disease transmission efficiency. So not only are there more mosquitoes, for example, but those mosquitoes are more aggressive, they bite more, they take more blood meals. Um, so because of that, we know that climactic variables and perturbations can uh, affect disease uh, occurrence patterns. So throughout the world, if you look on a global scale, uh, there are many important vector-borne diseases such as malaria, dengue, West Nile virus, Rift Valley fever, tick-borne encephalitis, Lyme, Zika, etc that are on the rise, presumably because of increases in the population of their vectors. Then there are other infectious diseases like cholera, cryptosporidiosis, leptospirosis, that are waterborne, that are on the rise, presumably because of increasing uh, amounts of flood runoff and increasing water temperatures. There are foodborne diseases like salmonellosis and E. coli uh, that relate to sanitation issues and the difficulty in maintaining uh, sanitation in the face of some of this climactic change. There are airborne diseases such as Q fever and meningococcemia uh, that are on the rise, presumably because of higher relative humidities. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. So you, if you're as old as me, you may remember back about 25 years ago, there was a new disease that sprung up in the American West uh, around the Four Corners area of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah called Hantavirus Pulmonary Syndrome. And this was a new disease to us. We had never seen it before, although archeologists feel that some of the Anasazi hieroglyphic or petroglyphics describe a disease that was probably that. Uh, but this disease sprung up out of nowhere. Uh, hantaviruses are viruses that are common causes of hemorrhagic fever in Korea, uh, for example. But we in America had never experienced these um, until the 19, late, uh, or early 1990s. And so what we think happened there is that in the seven year period from 1985 to 1992, there was a prolific drought uh, in the Four Corners area. Now I realize this is an area of the country that's normally pretty arid anyway, but those seven years were particularly arid. And we think that led to a depletion of predator species of lynx and, uh, and uh, mountain lion and uh, wolves and foxes. And that depletion of predator species led to an overgrowth of mice. 
And then in kind of biblical fashion, those seven years of drought were followed by the El Nino, by two years of very heavy rain, in night, relatively heavy rain for that area of the world, um, in 1992 and 1993, and that led to a heavy growth of pine nuts, which are the favored food of the more mice. So that led to more more mice, and it's those mice that excrete the virus that causes hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. So this is a good, I think, model to use when we try to explain why some of these diseases are increasing. And we know that we in Nebraska are experiencing the very same cycle right now. So you've already heard in talks this morning how we went through a or prodigious drought um, in 2012 and 2013, and you now see that we are experiencing uh, an unusual amount of precipitation. And so we worry that some of these factors are coming into play uh, right here at home in Nebraska. And we know uh, also that many of these factors influence the development of other diseases as well. So I do a lot of travel medicine consultation, and so I prescribe malaria prophylaxis, for example, to people who are going uh, to other parts of the world where malaria is endemic. And we always say that, you know, there's not much malaria of, above about 5,000 feet in elevation. So if you are going, for example, uh, to Machu Picchu in Peru, Peru on vacation, which is at 13,000 feet, even though there's malaria in some areas of Peru, you don't need to worry about it because there's no malaria at those elevations. But we're seeing that more and more that's not true, that the mosquitoes that transmit malaria are reaching higher and higher altitudes. And we think that's, again, uh, because of warming trends. So the bottom line in infectious diseases is that our greatest threat uh, may also be our smallest. So again, I work at the biocontainment unit. You may uh, be familiar with the fact that we took care of three Ebola uh, patients back in 2014. And right around the time we were patting ourselves on the back for the successful management of these few patients, uh, Zika hit us. And I think Zika is a great example of a threat to us here in Nebraska. So uh, you just heard Scott tell you about Culex mosquitoes, which are the typical Nebraska backyard barbecue mosquito. Um, and until West Nile, virus came along, those mosquitoes were pretty harmless. They're a nuisance when you're trying to picnic uh, in the backyard, but beyond that, until West Nile virus, they were pretty harmless. Um, that's not the case with many other species of mosquitoes. So Aedes is the mosquito that transmits Zika, uh, as well as dengue, as well as chikungunya, and yellow fever and all kinds of other nasty diseases. And the most competent vector for Zika and for many of those other diseases is Aedes aegypti. And Aedes aegypti has classically been a tropical mosquito confined originally to the tropics, to uh, the area between 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south latitude. We know that it's no longer confined to that area. It's been moving progressively northward now for many, many years. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner there, uh, the map that shows its current presence in the United States. Perhaps more worrisome uh, is another species of Aedes, Aedes albopictus, the uh, Asian tiger mosquito. And that's a sub, or at least it always was a subtropical mosquito, but you can see it's moving northward as well. So it's perhaps not the best or the most ideal or the preferred vector uh, for Zika virus, but it's a competent vector and it can transmit it. And you can see um, it is, if you look at the lower uh, right-hand corner of the state of Nebraska there, it's into Nebraska. So there have been isolates of that mosquito around the Falls City area. And again, every year it moves further and further northward. Same thing is true about um, a lot of other diseases that are related to these mosquitoes in other parts of the world. Um, and this is an estimate by the World Health Organization suggesting that an additional 2 billion people will be susceptible to the disease dengue by the, age, uh, by the year 2080. And dengue is transmitted by those same 80s mosquitoes. So if we become at risk for Zika, we're also at risk for chikungunya, for uh, dengue, and for yellow fever. So malaria, though, is transmitted by yet another species of mosquito, Anopheles. Um, and Anopheles is not 
fortunately not present currently uh, in the United States. We've pretty much, era well, it's present in small areas of the Southeast, but we've, um, we've eradicated, or eliminated rather, uh, malaria-infected Anopheles from the United States many, many years ago. But this is globally the most important mosquito-borne disease. Uh, it still kills between one and two million children a year throughout the developing world, uh, and it is poised to return. Uh, so we know that plasmodium species, the causative agent of malaria, grow faster at higher temperatures. But not only that, the vectoral capacity of mosquitoes that transmit it also increases at higher temperature. The lifespan of those mosquitoes increases at higher temperatures. So they can survive longer and have more opportunity to bite you. The females take more blood meals and they bite more aggressively. So all of that uh, poses, I think you can see, uh, a risk to us in, in the world of infectious diseases. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts that the global population for that disease, for malaria, will increase by a couple of hundred million in the next century. So I realize that amongst some people, I suspect that's not true of anybody in this room, uh, but amongst some people there's still some controversy about uh, climate change and about global warming and is it true and if it's true is it anthropogenic and if it's anthropogenic is that a, a bad thing necessarily and finally what can we do about it so I do want I am cognizant of wanting to present both sides of the issue when you talk about infectious diseases uh, we concentrate on the diseases that are likely to become more frequent uh, as climate changes but I uh, in in the uh, Full disclosure, I will admit that there is a little bit of evidence that some diseases could become less frequent. Uh, so respiratory syncytial virus um, is a common cause of bronchiolitis, which can be a relatively severe lower respiratory tract infection in young infants. That virus is very closely linked to period to cold periods of the year. So the season for RSV in Nebraska is typically November through March. And there is some evidence the season for RSV is getting shorter. Uh, but there are very few diseases for which that sort of rationale can be applied. People have looked at influenza, which is also associated with winter time, cold temperatures, and there's not yet any good evidence that the influenza season is shortening uh, due to this global climate change. So uh, anyway, and then there are some diseases where the, the kind of conclusions are a little bit mixed. So uh, this is a map of Lyme disease incidence in the United States, and you can see it has definitely increased. Uh, so there's a lot more Lyme disease concentrated along the eastern seaboard, but also uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin than there was a decade or two ago. Uh, that's bad news on the surface, uh, obviously. That's more human disease, more human morbidity. But part of the reason uh, for that increase in Lyme disease is emphasis on uh, reforestation and, uh, and increasing green space in what has always been a very industrialized section of the country. So the increase in forest reforestation has led to more deer uh, in living in the forests, and the more deer leads to more deer ticks, and the deer ticks are what transmits Lyme disease. So you can interpret that as, I guess, good news or bad news. Uh, beyond vector-borne diseases, there are also waterborne diseases that we need to worry about in the world of infectious diseases. And I don't know how many of you remember this outbreak, but in 1993, there was an outbreak of cryptosporidiosis, which is a diarrheal disease that affected 400,000 people, basically the entire population. Uh, of the city of Milwaukee, uh, including 54 deaths. And that had been preceded by very heavy rainfall. And so what basically happened is it backed up into the water treatment facilities and the entire municipal water supply of Milwaukee became contaminated. And it cost them $31 million in 1993 dollars to clean up this mess. And I think you can see that's what's going on in Nebraska here puts us at similar sort of risk. 
We know that heavy downpours are increasing, uh, and we know that those heavy downpours lead to potential problems with water treatment, sewage, and the like. Uh, beyond that, there are uh, increases in foodborne diseases and nutritional diseases. Rising temperatures can decrease food safety. Uh, many of the food pathogens like Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter do better in warm, humid conditions. So that picnic that you hold outdoors and you leave the chicken sitting around for a little while, uh, as the temperature increases, the amount of time you can leave that out uh, shortens, and that translates into an increased risk in, uh, of, of foodborne diseases. And then finally, this is not really related to uh, infectious diseases, and Scott really addressed it pretty well already, uh, but the mental health issues, I, I have to mention this because I spent 30 years in the Army, retired three and a half years ago, and joined the faculty here. Um, at the University of Nebraska, but five of my nine tours of duty um, were in Texas. And they say that a two degree tem uh, centigrade temperature increase um, can make people angrier. So I ought to be one very angry son of a bitch spending all that time uh, in, in far south Texas. In any case, I'll close by just summarizing. This is kind of the model. So climate change, including global warming, but also including changes in rainfall and extreme events, um, causes a number of factors like contamination of water by food and bacteria, increase of the activity of disease-bearing vectors, expansion of the ranges of those vectors that lead to effects like an increase in water and foodborne uh, diseases and an increase in expansion of mosquito-borne diseases. So that kind of puts it in summary. Uh, with that said, I will uh, close this portion of the talk and turn it to, over to Melanie. I always like presenting with other people who have good facts that um, scare the bejesus out of all of us, I think. So um, I, Jesse asked me to kind of mop things up here at the end and talk about climate and healthcare, that we talk about public health and how that impacts, but then also healthcare um, and what we are doing at the Med Center and how that matters. Um, so I think it's important to remember as we're talking about all of these things that um, the United States is a huge emi uh, emitter on their own of carbon dioxide and, and methane, um, but then the healthcare industry within the United States is also a huge emitter. Um, and a lot of that is because we're extremely energy intensive in providing quality health care. Um, a lot of people don't think about how those systems run differently. And I won't bore you with all the details, but um, what I like to tell people is like it used to be in the 50s, like you would open up the window in your hospital room and, and let fresh air in and that doesn't happen anymore. You get clean, sterile air in a hospital and you do not want it recirculated so that what the other person is exhaling, you are breathing in. And that makes good public health sense, um, but it also is kind of the equivalent of putting a fan on one end of your hospital, using energy to pull it through a whole bunch of filters and then using another fan on the other end and pushing it out of the building. So if you were to put two boxes fans on both sides of your houses, what would happen to your energy bill? That's what we're doing in healthcare. Um, and it's good and it's, it's kind of like cows will produce methane, hospitals will use energy. Um, and so, but the volume of that energy that we use is a huge emitter. And so if you would actually just take healthcare um, providers in the United States and look at just their emissions, they're in the number seven country in the world. Um, so it's a huge amount of energy that gets used. Um, and so you kind of have to question about, you know, when you're providing health care, what kind of health care are you actually providing? Um, in just 2013, the pollution um, from U.S. health care uh, resulted in 470,000 uh, years of life, so kind of those dailies as they call them. Um, so the good news of this is that as a healthcare provider, you also have the impact for far-reaching change. That um, you know, if you're looking for another country to make some change, healthcare can do that on their own. 
Uh, and so that is something that we're working at UNMC in Nebraska Medicine. Um, it's directly related to our mission of, of leading the world um, to provide a healthy future. You certainly can't do that if you're getting people ill in the process. Um, and so I think uh, what both presenters have, have kind of hit on before, there are lots of risk factors um, and pollution is directly tied to that. So when we emit carbon dioxide and methane and things in the atmosphere, you're breathing that in. Um, I'll look to, to Jesse here. I think we're the number six state um, for asthma deaths in the United States, Nebraska is. Um, so the best asthma attack is the one that you never have. And so um, they will never let me anywhere near a patient to treat them. But I feel that, you know, what I do is still healthcare. It's still mission-based. It's still related um, because we can prevent these things from happening. And so in 2010, we got um, really started this in earnest. Uh, and the energy that we reduced from 2010 to 2017 was a reduction of 251 million kilowatt hours. And that's the equivalent of any one of those bullets, um, not all together, just any one of them. Um, but it's the equivalent of, say, taking 50,000 cars off the road and all the tailpipe emissions that have come from that. So it's a large amount of energy that we reduced um, and then a, a big savings in, uh, to the air quality of Omaha on top of that. Um, those same impacts uh, resulted in these noxious gases not being put off into the atmosphere. I always find fascination in 11 tons of mercury not going into the atmosphere. I mean, we talk about pulling like mercury thermometers out of homes because of the risk, but meanwhile, we're burning coal and, and putting tons of mercury into the atmosphere that we're breathing in. So um, those direct medical costs are things like emergency room visits and uh, different uh, direct things that you're going to pay or your insurance is going to pay for. Um, but then the added value to that is an additional $20 million for things because you didn't miss work, your child didn't go to the daycare, things like that. Uh, so last, or actually in 2017, we kind of upped our goals. Uh, we had 2050 goals. We upped them to what we now kind of call our 2030 goals. So we're going to be net zero building emission, uh, net zero waste, and what is known as net zero water. But people get really kind of weird about that. So it's a 54% reduction. Um, but we're trying to be good stewards in an effort to provide better care. And we've done that by using active transportation. We provide a lot of benefits to our staff and students regarding that. And we always talk about kind of our triple bottom line, um, so people, planet, and profits, that we want to kind of meet things in the middle there. And our active transportation program, which we call Travel Smart, has done a really good job of that. Um, we're saving more than $22 million, which is what a parking garage would cost to build, which is just absolutely insane. But $22 million for a parking garage. So we're avoiding building that. We're also avoiding um, all the, those cars coming to campus, which is traffic uh, emissions, congestion, all of those things. And then the employees that are taking part are also noting things like having less stress. Um, they're taking less medications. We have people who are coming back to us and saying, oh, I you know, started walking a half a mile to work and home and not only am I less stressed, but I don't have to take my blood pressure medication anymore. My doctor is so happy about that. Um, and they're happy about that, that they don't have to pay for that and that risk factor has gone down. So it's fantastic. Um, and then we're looking to do uh, some other things uh, related to that. So we just uh, put on the largest rooftop solar array in the state of Nebraska um, at 0.5 megawatts when it's running at full capacity. And by full capacity, I mean not covered in snow. Um, so now we're doing good. Um, and it was set up in that design because it is most efficient in the summer months. So I uh, went really fast there at the end because I know I'm sure people have questions, but that's all I have. Thanks. Yeah, if the, the panelists could just come up here for one second, and we'll, we'll have a few questions from the, the audience. Um, if not, I'll have a few questions. <laughs> you can just sit over there. Or stand, whatever maybe you feel most comfortable with. Um, so just, yeah, to open it up, I was hoping to have some, see what the potential questions were from the audience. Uh, two quick questions. Back on the reuse thing that you were talking about, Jesse. Uh, can you talk, Ming, on just the use of cardboard and the packaging and medicine, I mean, there's such some things wasted in packaging and all that. What are you looking at in addressing that? The second quick thing, too, for the physician, too, in the group, is sometimes the use of unnecessary tests or over-testing, for example, like x-rays being redone from one hospital, getting it redone the other, energy usage and all of that in. Has there been any quality assurance that you're looking at since you're the med center on addressing re, uh, uh, again, the cardboard stuff 
and then the uh, redoing of x-rays, ultrasounds, all that kind of stuff that's being done out there. I'll take part A. Okay, um, so from a use standpoint, um, we're doing a full-scale analysis on everything I'm purchasing. So um, anything that we can order differently to have less packaging, uh, less shipping materials, anything like that to reduce. I mean, people love to recycle, but it's really about reduction first. Um, and so we're, we're, we are working with our purchasing people in order to do that. Um, simple things like even research laboratories that have a standing contract with people and so they can order supplies whenever they want. We're getting them to combine orders so there's less boxes and less things like that. Um, but then also providing recycling resources on the back end. Um, some of that is difficult. There are uh, lots of single-use medical devices that are again part of quality health care that are hard to recycle because they're made of multiple materials. But we're working on aspects of that and working with suppliers that are now um, kind of going what they call cradle to grave. So they are responsible for the product that they're creating in terms of take, uh, selling it at the beginning, but then taking it back at the end and uh, recycling or refurbishing it. And as for x-rays. <laughs> yeah, so the question about x-rays and ultrasounds and te lab tests being repeated is a great one. And it's one that's plagued medicine, obviously, for decades and decades. And um, I, I would never uh, accuse physicians of being best friends with insurance uh, companies. Uh, but I think this is an area where the insurance company is dragging us, kicking and screaming into some sort of reform because, you know, less and less often are they willing to pay for a test to be repeated um, if it's known that that test was already ordered somewhere else. And then with x-rays in particular, I think technology is slowly helping. And I, I realize this change is coming um, very slowly and probably too slowly. But um, with x-rays, you know, obviously if I'm seeing you as a patient and I need to um, view some x-ray finding and the x-ray was done at some hospital out in Shadron and it's going to take eight hours to get, you know, it's just easier for me to repeat it. And, you know, whether that's laziness or good practice or whatever, we can debate. But the technology, I think, is saving us in that sense, in the sense that, you know, that's all computerized now. Now, for a long time, the, the fidelity and pixel uh, capability of x-rays for example was never good enough for most physicians and so they but now it's better than plain films and so it's you know much easier now to pull up a patient's x-rays from from anywhere in the country and uh, so it's slowly getting better I realize not fast enough probably so we have some other questions out there I, oh okay So for Ted, um, have you continued to do talks in outstate Nebraska? What, what has been the response? Yeah, no, so I have. So I, I, I certainly don't pretend to be an expert in climate change. But I, you know, over the last couple of years, certainly uh, gotten um, more and more involved in some of the public ha health aspects. So we uh, have at uh, um, UNMC an uh, uh, entity known as the Center for Preparedness Education. And one of our missions is to um, state-funded mission to go out and, again, train first responders, public health officials, emergency preparedness professionals and stuff. And so we've done a series of symposia and stuff, and we talk about climate change and some of those. And it's well-received, I have to say. I, I don't meet any big resistance. So my fears, my, my original fears have not yet been realized. Are you talking to the um, Yeah, so... Um, I speak in a lot of different forums, so I, uh, medical professionals, public health officials, preparedness uh, officials, and it's become a little bit of a cottage industry. So I was asked to go to Maine last year and talk, so I had to adapt the climate change talk to what's going on in Maine. And um, there's another example of where the news is actually temporarily good because lobster harvests in Maine are at record levels. And the thought because of warming in the Gulf of Maine has actually increased the uh, lobster harvest at the expense of Rhode Island, places further south, where the lobster harvests are poorer. The, what I try to impress upon the people in Maine is that, yes, temporarily you're enjoying good times, but if this continues, those lobster harvests will move up to Nova Scotia at the expense of Maine. And, and then I also, uh, a few months ago, got asked to give a similar talk in Hawaii. I had to accept that reluctantly, but... Uh, <laughs> So we talked a lot about red tides and uh, the effects on um, Hawaii's tourism economy as, you know, Waikiki Beach is shut down because of red tide. 
uh, for example, and stuff. So th those talks were mainly to medical and public health professionals. And I, I can jump in here on that just a little bit as well. Um, you know, I've done a number of talks, uh, especially in my new role at UNMC, but one of the things that I've done a couple talks to was actually social workers. Uh, the National Association for Social Workers, the Nebraska chapter, invited me to give a talk on climate change and health. Um, especially focused in on vulnerable populations and how it might potentially be impacting vulnerable populations in Nebraska. And one of the things, one of the initiatives that we're hoping to, to develop is um, talking to some of those medical students and have, a, actually getting in there and, and educating them on the impacts of climate change on human health. Because I think it's starting to become more and more apparent with medical doctors what this actually means as far as their patient population. And at UNMC, at the College of Public Health, my hope and my goal is for every MPH student that comes through there, at least hears about climate change and the impacts of climate change on public health uh, before they leave the school as we develop and as we move forward. Ben, please. Uh, this has just been an absolutely magnificent panel. I, I congratulate you all. This is, this is just gut-wrenching. Um, could I request, though, that you all make appointments with our U.S. Senators and our Governor to explain this <laughs> issue to them? Because there seems to be a real disconnect. Yeah. Anyone have a question? I have a question for Mr. Holmes. Um, I would like to know, what would you say to someone who uh, maintains that what we just experienced in the last week here in Nebraska is a, just a cycle, just due to a cycle, uh, that it was a 500-year event. I would say talk to a climate scientist down the road as they do the attribution and try to determine if that's the case. Um, I was wondering, have you heard of um, One Health, and if yes, could you talk a little bit about that and anything you're doing in that respect? C could you say that again? I'm sorry. Have you heard of um, like the One Health initiative, and if yes, um, could you explain it a little bit and what you're doing to work with that? Yeah, I, I, Scott, do you want to start off? Sure, I can take a stab at that. So uh, I've been involved with One Health in Nebraska since it started and uh, serve on an advisory committee toward that. One Health is basically the concept that all our environment is interconnected as well as humans, plants, and animals, um, and that the things that affect human health also affect animal health and may also affect plant health. With really, many of the topics that have been presented at this conference would be similarly potentially presented at a One Health conference. Um, to maybe add to what Ted talked about, like with the deer ticks, well, in Nebraska, we're seeing eastern red cedar come up through the state. Uh, it's already happened south of us. With that come deer. With that will come deer ticks. And as the weather continues to modify, we will get more and more mesquite or more and more ticks that carry Lyme disease, and we'll have more Lyme disease. Well, it just so happens that there's also the same tick carries uh, cattle disease and that's being studied in the state and it's increasing the number of cattle that are contracting that disease. So it's the same issue for humans, for animals, and uh, our environment's interrelated to it. So that's sort of one health in a nutshell. Question. What's the, what's the role of public health in getting involved in some of these issues uh, like we've seen in Lancaster County where people don't like to see wind turbines which are part of the prevention of this whole it, of, of climate change. So since uh, I only spent like six years dealing with wind turbines and noise and uh, that I can answer that question too. Um, the role of public health is to focus on the science of public health and that's exactly what we tried to do. Um, our role is not to uh, advocate and uh, cause wind turbines to be located in our own jurisdiction. Our role is to ensure that if they're located in our jurisdiction, they're done in such a way that they protect the health of the citizens that live here. Uh, that's a balancing act that we provide the scientific information on that, and then it's up to elected officials to make decisions on that. Uh, my job is not to make that decision, it's to provide that guidance. And uh, we've tried to balance that as best we can. It's not an easy thing to do. 
especially when one of the core principles of public health is called the precautionary principle, which is when you don't have adequate information, you try not to make decisions that could be long-term consequences on people. And uh, frankly, with wind turbines, there's a significant lack of adequate data on uh, particular potential outcomes when it comes to children and people with disabilities, especially learning disabilities. So there's a balancing act there, but uh, obviously we also favor wind turbines because they do reduce carbon emissions and things like that. So, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, my, my question is um, at this, both the state and the local and regional levels, who's driving the planning for the next pandemic, uh, presumably bird flu? Yeah, I, it's, uh, I'm laugh, we're laughing because it's a tough question to answer. Uh, you know, um, we are a federalist system here in the United States and authority is uh, divested downwards as, to as great a degree as possible. So most public health um, in the country is actually handled at the local level. So it's Lincoln Lancaster, for example, it, it, here in the Lincoln area that, you know, are the are in charge, if you will, um, of public health. Um, with that said, there is obviously a state health department and there's the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, I, I actually worked there for three and a half years. I was the military's liaison officer there. And so they, they try to set the national agenda um, in many ways and they are very, um, proactive um, in, in this uh, realm of uh, climate change health. It's something the Centers for Disease Control is becoming more and more involved with. Um, but they only uh, make recommendations. You know, the CDC has no power to compel uh, states and localities, other than the power of the purse. They dispense a lot of grant money, and sometimes they can, as a, as a condition of accepting that grant money, um, they can impose certain restrictions on states and localities and stuff. But with that all said, I, I don't think any of us at the state level or local level um, uh, would have any reason to not get on board with uh, many of these initiatives. So I, I, I guess if I had to point to one entity that sets the, um, the pace for these discussions and co-op cooperative um, arrangements, it would be them. I don't know, if, Scott, if you have any. Um, so the next pandemic will come, and so that's accurate. Uh, and there is always uh, federal dollars that come downstream for planning for preparedness and almost every local health district in the state of Nebraska has a preparedness plan that includes a pandemic flu plan. And uh, that doesn't mean that we're going to prevent it, it means we're going to react to it and try to contain it. Uh, after the H1N1 experience a few years back, I'm not so sold on the idea of containment through isolation and circular isolation, concentric isolation. I think that people and things in our society move too quickly for that plan, which is really designed on what might have worked uh, 50, 70 years ago, so. Are there any other questions? Are we? One more. One more question. Scott, I want to thank you for your um, bold and courageous uh, and very honest presentation. I can only imagine what you've been through this last week dealing with Lincoln's water supply. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us anything more about that, and I understand some of it may be confidential, but I was wondering if you could um, flesh out a little bit more um, what the risks were to Lincoln's water supply and if contamination was an issue you were dealing with. If what? I'm sorry, what was the last question? If contamination was oh. an issue. Yeah, so contamination was never an issue for us, fortunately. Um, wells, if they're well designed, uh, in general protect the groundwater from contamination. And so Lincoln does not draw its water from the Platte River. It draws its water from 80 to 90 feet below the Platte River. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think of in this room if I can look at something and describe it. So um, basically the Platte comes down like this 
Lincoln has wells here, here, and here, and here. And as the levee broke uh, way up north near the Thomas Lakes, that washed down through and damaged the well field significantly. Uh, the Platte River, of course, rose over two feet above any previous flood level ever recorded, which means that an island that has been on, uh, in existence for decades and decades actually had water flowing over it, which was the picture you saw. And that damaged a well, which also damaged electricity coming to that well at the front end. So there was electrical power lost. Um, there was redundant power and, elect and well fields on the other side. But then that was also damaged. And uh, for a time there, we had no water coming into our treatment plant. However, there never was any contamination issue. Uh, and as far as any concern on that. And we did additional, multiple additional testings, both of raw water, finished water, and throughout the system in Lincoln to make sure that there wasn't any concern at all. We also watched our surveillance systems that we have in Lincoln for any increases in uh, diarrheal or vomiting type diseases. So, yeah, a pretty serious situation. So with that, thank you very much. I, I greatly appreciate our panelists, uh, Scott, Ted, and Melanie. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, thank you very much for listening to us today as well.